Hi, welcome to Northern Lights. I'm Linda McCracken Hunt, and we're pleased to present a two part program on acclaimed Minnesota architect Ralph Rapson, centered around the publication of his biography, Ralph Rapson 60 Years of Modern Design, published by Afton Historical Society Press. We'll be talking with Ralph later in the program and taking a tour of exhibitions of his work at the Weissman Art Museum and the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. I think the, the, the exhibit here at the uh, Art Institute is, for me, is most gratifying to, to see all of these uh, drawings reassembled and we'd never seen them all together before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you and all the people that worked on it are so, are to be congratulated for your well, putting all this together. Now we'll be discussing the creation and production of the book with the three authors. To my left is Bruce Wright, who is an architect and public relations consultant, editor of Fabric Architecture Magazine, and formerly managing editor of Architecture Minnesota and Public Art Review. To Bruce's left is, Rip, is Jane King Hessian. Hess, Hessian. Hessian. Hessian, sorry. Architectural researcher and writer, guest curator of the Weissman Art Museum exhibit, and she has a Master's of Architecture degree from the University of Minnesota. And to her left is Rip Rapson, who is a senior fellow of the U of M Design Center for American Urban Landscape, formerly deputy mayor of the city of Minneapolis, and an attorney. So I'd like to start with having um, Jane perhaps just give us a little bit of background as to how the book came about and why it was done. Well, the book actually um, has been an idea that several people have had for a long time, and it's, it's I would say, a long overdue project on Ralph. Um, you did say that he's an acclaimed Minnesota architect, which is true. He headed the School of, the Uni the School of Architecture at the University of Minnesota for 30 years and has built um, a number of significant projects in, in Minneapolis and the Twin Cities area, notably the Guthrie Theater. Um, but also, Ralph has had an incredible um, national and international career that many are not aware of. He uh, began his career in Cranbrook uh, back in the 1930s. Uh, he headed the Department of Architecture at the Institute of Design, or the new Bauhaus in Chicago in the 40s, taught at MIT, designed a number of our U.S. Embassy projects abroad. So he um, has really a, has had a stellar career, and it was time to do a book. Um, the book actually probably got a, a good push with the um, idea that the Institute of Arts and the Wiseman Museum of Art um, wanted to mount joint exhibitions on Ralph. So both projects, um, it seemed like a very good idea that the book um, be completed at the time that the exhibitions would open. We're here at the Wiseman Art Museum at the University of Minnesota um, in one half of the Ralph Rapson 60 Years of Modern Design exhibition. And here at the Wiseman, we feature the public works of Ralph Rapson. Um, Ralph, maybe you would like to discuss or point out what's the oldest work that we have in here or where you began your public career, in a sense. Well, I think the uh, oldest building or the oldest drawing here is uh, one that was done at the University of Michigan when I was a student, a final kind of traveling scholarship type of uh, thing. And then as you go through the exhibit, you'll find other drawings from Cranbrook. And then from there, you'll find drawings, material from my experiences in Chicago and later on um, Boston and then foreign work uh, like the embassy work. We here at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts were introduced to Ralph Rapson's drawings several years ago and we featured them in an exhibition uh, on the architecture of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And at that time we realized that here was a large collection by an architect who worked uh, not only locally but nationally and internationally and that uh, his drawings and his work needed to be shown to the greater public. So we 
put together this exhibition along with the Weissman Art Museum. And at the same time, uh, there was research for a book on Ralph Rapson, so we all worked collaboratively together to produce this project, uh, which has many different aspects, using Ralph's collection of drawings, a large collection, also photographs, furniture, and other materials to put these uh, projects together. What I think is really fascinating about the book is that uh, it, it really does span his entire career from his very early days until most recent work. How do three authors work together to mm -hmm. write one book? How, how do you divvy up the work? No, it wouldn't have be, been so bad, <laughs> uh, it, except I think that it's also three or four books in one. I mean, it, it, not only is it just a sort of a chronology of one person's life, it also walks you through with the formative years of modernism, as there is all of this hubbub and excitement about what was going to happen in the post-war years and how design would be different and how furniture design would be different and urban planning would be different, and really virtually every aspect of American life. So there needed to be a heavy dose of, of history. Uh, there needed to also, I think, be a heavy dose of personality just because mm -hmm. Dad is a fascinating guy in fascinating times and loves to tell stories about both. And so the idea that it was a biography and a history and sort of a personal set of reflections as well as um, a compilation of work, which is, I think, for many architects, the key issue, made it um, both easier and harder. Easier, I think, from my perspective, in the sense that we could all sort of do what we do well. Um, I love telling stories. Jane is a terrific historian, and Bruce is a great critic. And so the, the ability to sort of combine those strands um, made it easier. But on the other hand, making it all mush <laughs> into a coherent whole is I think was challenging. I mean, I think we yeah. each have different writing styles, different critical styles, different research styles. And so it, at times it was not as easy as it should have been, probably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How long did it actually take you from beginning to end? 46 on this years. <laughs> uh, I think it began about three years ago almost, uh, or maybe even, even more before than that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it, the thing that to me was amazing was. Um, as we would review various aspects of the book in terms of shaping it and forming the chapters, we would discover more and more aspects mm -hmm. of Ralph's life that uh, we hadn't uncovered yet. And, uh, and as we co continued to uh, interview him and, and question aspects, more and more came out. So uh, I think it just, it was a, I, think, I don't know that anybody really anticipated that it would be as big as it was. I think another point is Ralph has um, a huge archives. Um, mm -hmm. He has saved most of what he has ever drawn, and there's just voluminous material that was available to us. Um, but as Bruce suggested, kind of incrementally, we would develop some and then find a new cache of material. So in terms of um, beyond the writing, selecting visuals, uh, mm -hmm. the photographs, and actually the drawn material of Ralph, which we feel is really one of the very strongest mm -hmm. and most interesting aspects of the book. Um, was, it was kind of a treasure hunt in terms of, of searching for this material and trying to um, choose what not to use, let alone what to use. It was more than a little exasperating, I think, for the publisher, because the publisher, I think most publishers are, are was accustomed to receiving a A to Z outline of the book, <laughs> never changes, this is yeah. how many images, this is how many pages, this is, these are the broad themes. And I think, as Bruce and Jane have suggested, not only did the material change, but in some cases, the subject matter changed. Um, mm -hmm. I, we initially had thought that the book would run in roughly chronological order. But then what happens when you land on a topic area, like furniture design, mm -hmm. that goes into the 30s and goes into the 50s and, and lands somewhere in between from the rest of the time? And uh, it, ma it made a whole set of decisions um, necessary on the fly. And, and I think that's one of the things that made it fun, is that it mm -hmm. was, a, I think, the book design and the book layout ends up reflecting some of that dynamism. But it, the, the dynamism was actually part of the working process, and that, mm -hmm. that we were really constantly shifting and changing and figuring out what the best material was and whether we should essentially dump an entire chapter. In a couple of cases, we did that. We substituted a yeah. uh, chapter I had in mind for one Jane felt would be more focused on home housing projects. And it was. Uh, I found that a fascinating process of give and take and in and out. And as I say, I think the mm -hmm. publisher is scarred permanently from that. <laughs> no, sorry. That's the business. <laughs>
Well, it must have been very difficult to get it into one do document because you yeah. could have had the early years as a volume, you could have had the furniture design as a volume, Arch uh, the architect as an educator. Yeah, and, um, and yeah. speaking of education, that was another aspect that we knew we had to include at almost every level, and that was a difficult one to handle, and it got woven, I think, fairly successfully into the whole book as far as, you know, the importance of education and Ralph's importance on architectural education. It really so begins almost from the get-go. I mean, if, you, yeah. if we were to begin to sort of walk uh, mm -hmm. a viewer through the chronology, from the very first years that Dad starts at the University of Michigan, essentially, in a mm -hmm. fairly traditional program, trying to do something a little less traditional with the program, mm -hmm. and moving from that into his early years at Cranbrook uh, uh, in Bloomfield, Michigan, where there was a very different approach to design of sort of the interdisciplinary quality of getting weavers, working with filmmakers, working with designers, working with mm -hmm. metal workers. Um, it had a profound influence, not just on Dad as a, as a designer or as someone who used drawing as a process of working out his ideas, but also as an educational philosophy. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, when I ended up sort of looking more closely at the chapter of his coming to Minnesota, 30 years later, I realized that there were so many things that came out of that Cranbrook year in mm -hmm. terms of his interest in having all sorts of disciplines going at one another and having different kinds of integration of program that mm -hmm. uh, most architectural schools at the time weren't doing. It's, a, it's very interesting to sort of trace, trace his history back through his roots. This was when, 1938, 39, uh, we were just coming out of, uh, the country was just coming out of the Great Depression. and. Uh, there wasn't an awful lot of work uh, actual being built. So an awful lot of the, the work was of a theoretical nature. Yes, I was involved very much in the uh, very early days of, uh, of design in this country. And, uh, and I've been fortunate in my, over my experience to have been working with a number of the top uh, important uh, contemporary architects of the time going all the way from Elio Saarinen and, uh, and incidentally Frank Lloyd Wright. I did know Wright, Wright quite well and uh, had a number of encounters with him. Uh, uh, I must say that all of these uh, people I worked with, Jane, were wonderful draftsmen. I think uh, Elio Saarinen was probably the world's greatest draftsman that I've experienced, but Eero, his son, was tremendous. Uh, Cranbrook is a marvelous place. Uh, it was a kind of a created as a kind of a utopian setting for, uh, for the arts, people studying under relatively famous people. And we also had the advantage of having Ralph to, um, <laughs> to yes. interview yeah. and to interpret the material for us. And, and that's another, <laughs> actually two other facets of the book that I think are somewhat unique. One um, facet would be, we have a lot of Ralph's stories in there. I mean, Ralph yes. had personal recollections about yeah. Frank Lloyd Wright and Elio and Eero Sarn and Alvar Aalto, uh, Mies van der Rohe, Laszlo Moholy Nagy, Buxminster Fuller, I mean giants of mm -hmm. 20th century architecture, he knew them all. Yeah. Um, and they're wonderful stories. The second feature um, mm -hmm. is the architectural timeline that Ralph created for the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, he drew over 250 uh, drawings for us of the work of architects that he admired, felt were significant in the development of modernism or to 20th century design, mm -hmm. some of his own work. And this forms a continuum throughout the book, which we hope emphasizes Ralph's long career, over 60 years and counting that he has practiced, and also suggests the backdrop against which he was practicing um, mm -hmm. in the 20th century. I had a lot of people mention that they, they enjoyed just looking at the timeline, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. that just yes. seeing how um, one person stitches together so yeah. many different traditions and influences yeah. is for them uh, reason enough to kind of glance through it. I think another uh, wonderful aspect about that is that unlike a lot of architectural books which are more sort of glorified coffee table picture books, um, this one gives context to all of what's in it and uh, I think that's the unique thing about Ralph's career is that he he's not uh, the individualist as let's say the uh, uh, Ayn Rand, uh, mm -hmm. Fountainhead, uh, our individualist, but he's the individualist who is there, as you had mentioned, the, the Forrest Gump. I don't know if we should continue <laughs> to repeat that uh, uh, metaphor, but uh, someone who was there interacted and, and really influenced many, many people, rather than just being isolated.
Just before we leave the creative process, I, one of the things that I found most helpful as an author is having essentially two critics on staff. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I could do a chapter and Bruce would then say, I really need to know more about the Blah House. This doesn't tell me enough about what's going on around this era. And Jane was particularly good at that, having just completed a degree. Bruce completed his 30 or 40 years ago. But Jane was fresh from her degree, and mm -hmm. um, it, was fun to, <laughs> it was fun to have her say, you know, if you really understood a little bit what was going on over here, it makes this much more contextual. So rather than just sort of relying on an editor, as is the usual process with a single author and a single editor, I like to think we each had three editors. I mean, we mm -hmm. kind of all could compare and contrast. And as a, as a result, I think you get a, a certain animation in the storyline that uh, is unusual for a book of this kind. Mm -hmm. well, the book, I think, reaches many different levels. There are the fascinating stories that are just mm -hmm. fun to read. Mm -hmm. And then there's the depth of the architectural work and that timeline, the, the architectural historical timeline is something that even when you're reading the book, for myself anyway, I tend to not look at the timeline because I'm reading mm -hmm. the words, mm -hmm. but then to go back just to look at the timeline and realize mm -hmm. that, oh, while that was happening with Corbu, he was doing this and mm -hmm. look at that connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I gather from reading the book, that Ralph remembers all of these great stories and conversations, but he also, I think, kept some diaries, mm -hmm. or a diary, or a running. <laughs> and yes. And, and <laughs> I'm assuming you got to work with some of that information to really remember the specifics, or did he just remember it all and we give did, it and pass we it We got on to, to look at it maybe from the outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're all grinning because <laughs> the very first time we find out there's a diary is, of course, after we've written the chapter on which the diary <laughs> has something to do with Dad says, oh, by the way, I have this little book that <laughs> is you know, a day-to-day -day description of his life at Cranbrook. And he read us this wild passage of, uh, about something that was either quite personal or quite outrageous, I can't remember which. And we thought, hmm, this could, this could <laughs> really just change nice. the tone of this chapter. Spin the <laughs> <laughs> and we often joked because he actually was a little reluctant to let us look no. at the diary. I, I think we certainly could have. Um, mm -hmm. And we did look in bits and pieces. As Jane was mentioning earlier before we got on camera, that it was sort of like a, a reading aloud session. He would read to us uh, yeah, the, the passages he thought we could mm -hmm. handle. Well, there's <laughs> such a depth of work. I don't know how, uh, with a career as long and as Ralph has had and as intensive a work effort that he's had, mm -hmm. how he could keep track of mm -hmm. everything he's done. I mean, mm -hmm. I think for those of us who have known him by when he was an educator at the university or other aspects, it was new to all of us, mm -hmm. the, the realm yeah. of yeah. work he had done. Yeah. I think that's a really important point because, because he has been in Minnesota since 1954, um, I think the tendency has been to focus on him as purely a Minnesota architect, uh, which he is, but he is so much more than that. And I think mm -hmm. it's interesting that you say um, a student of his was not aware of all of this. Yeah. The other, the other um, point is that Ralph truly had at least two careers going at mm -hmm. all times. <laughs> uh, he had a, uh, an active full-time practice always, mm -hmm. and he was a full-time educator. Not only yeah. did he lead the school, he was an active critic at the school. Mm -hmm. He was a guest As lecturer, a juror. At um, many, many schools, many yes. architectural schools around the country and the world. Absolutely. So. And so I think that um, that that's a very interesting and unique aspect of him, and I think that it's it did complicate the book a little bit to how how do you follow mm. that educational theme through, and yeah. I think we've alluded to that mm. because it it really shouldn't take a back seat to the architectural work. I don't think no. um, as an educator, Ralph is um, really renowned, and his students were sought after, well trained, and um, there's a very prestigious architectural award that's given called the Roach Traveling Fellowship. It's given to one student a year. And uh, over a 40-year period, 27 students who won the award were Ralph's students. It's an absolutely astounding mm -hmm. um, fact. Mm -hmm. So I think it, is, uh, it does attest to um, his skill as an, as an educator. But we had a terrible time trying to figure out how do you have a chapter spanning yeah. some 30 years mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. a, a ostensibly very few visuals. And I end up thinking that uh, the, that chapter, this chapter eight, the Minnesota mm -hmm. chapter, ended up being one of the more interesting mm -hmm. chapters for exactly the reason Jane has suggested, mm -hmm. because there was such a multi-dimensional aspect to Dad, even when he was teaching. Mm -hmm. When he was teaching, he was taking his students into the community for community projects. When he was teaching, yeah. he was bringing in these characters like Bucky Fuller to do 
wild, outrageous projects at the university campus. When he was teaching, he was also practicing and trying to integrate his principles of education into his principles of design and vice versa. So it ended up being a very interesting chapter, mm -hmm. I think, with lots of yeah. stuff that shows how, uh, in, a, in a complex career like this, all of, all of the work tends to reform internally, I mean, inform internally, tends to kind of uh, strengthen the other aspect of his life. He was very progressive in his teaching, too, oh, and yeah. coming up with different philosophies of how the school levels should be structured, the pyramid model. Yeah. Uh, studying abroad was yeah. something that yeah. architecture schools weren't doing at the time, which yeah. is very yeah. commonplace now. Architecture yeah. schools go for a, a semester or a year. As well as willing to take risks with uh, experimental types of uh, programs. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that a lot of that came from his uh, experiences with Laszlo Moholy Nagy. Um, because uh, he did indicate that, uh, as far as an educator, he really looked to Mah Maholi Nagy as a, a, ma a master of educational uh, technique. And uh, I can recall being in the uh, architecture studios in the 60s and 70s at Minnesota, and new, new experimental types of studio programs were being uh, tested. And some worked and some didn't, but the, the fact that he was willing to take the risk was really quite commendable. You know, so. it's so fun, though, to hear Bruce <laughs> describe that, is that I think one of the, the nice aspects of the book is it tends to humanize a lot of these yeah. characters, whether it's Frank Lloyd Wright or, yeah. or Mies. But I think particularly of, of Moholy now, yeah. uh, when Dad went to the Baugh House in oh. Chicago in the early 40s, it was on the second floor of a brownstone above the Chapery nightclub. <laughs> they went, uh, you know, they would steal nuts and chips down from mm -hmm. below to kind of <laughs> feed themselves. They were sort of a ragtag bunch. And it's, the idea, and, and Blue, Bruce is absolutely right, but the idea that there, this was a sort of a climate of, uh, of innovation and yeah. creativity. Well, the way Dad introduced life drawing at the Institute <laughs> of Design was to go downstairs, grab one of the, the, the waitresses from the, the Chapery stick her up in the nude and, uh, and have life drawing classes. And the first time Maholi Nag came in, uh, evidently he was sort of a... Prude. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the nice, nice, the nice word for it. I mean, he just sort of turned red and, and uh, turned out, and walked out, and uh, mm -hmm. let Dad do what he wanted to do. But there was a, I think, there was a sort of a, for me, an element of a humanizing of a process that we often think of as more formal and more you know, godlike, I mean, Mies yeah. and Gropius yeah. and all of these characters. Well, I mean, I think mm -hmm. one of the fun things of having someone who sort of walked through those, those times is to mm -hmm. say these were all people uh, of their time and of their element. And I think that was, mm -hmm. for me, what was what, so much fun yeah. is to see those yeah. great formative years in, in a, from one person's perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Jane, you were also the curator for the exhibit at the Weissman Art Museum. And how does the book tie into the exhibits? Well, I think they support each other. Um, at the Wiseman, we were able to uh, display um, things like models that, that we cannot um, obviously adequately display in a book. Um, the Wiseman exhibit focused on public architecture. I think the book was helpful in um, that we had gathered all the information. It was very helpful in um, telling the story at the Wiseman. We had the resource that we were able to do that. Um, so I think they work nicely together. Uh, I do think that showing a lot of Ralph's models were very important. We had a 12 by 12 foot Cedar mm -hmm. Riverside model um, mm -hmm. that at, at the Wiseman, and um, I think people tend to be able to really connect with models, and the public seemed mm -hmm. to really mm -hmm. be able to understand where they were and where Ralph was and what was happening in our city through um, the models that were exhibited. Well, it was a, it was a vision, it, uh, uh, and much of it was due to two people, Gloria Siegel and Keith Heller. Mm -hmm. And the basic thought was that here in the center of the city we could provide high density, high and low rise housing that would provide uh, a rich urban setting for, uh, for mixed uh, and across the board kinds of, of, of uh, people, both uh, uh, higher income and lower income and even subsidized and uh, market rate kind of housing. We were able to show um, a, a lot of embassy drawings, which, again, I think people were kind of stunned to learn that he had designed 12 of our embassy projects abroad. Yes, we did uh, several embassies, several State Department buildings in Europe, uh, American embassies in Stockholm and in Copenhagen, uh, housing in uh, Paris, outside of Paris, uh, a number of consulates in Bremen and uh, Le Havre, uh, 
the, the exhibits ended up using as well a lot of the, the book format for just mm -hmm. graphic presentation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think we're, uh, we're particularly proud of is how, how the book looks. We had a just yeah. terrific graphic designer named Christy Anderson, who I think was able to kind of convey some of the liveliness yeah. of the drawing. And I think in turn, some of that liveliness, I think, got reflected black back into both exhibits, which yeah. I think are really spectacular. I think Jane yeah. and the Weissman did a great job, and then the Art Institute, by recreating Dad's furniture shop in the 50s, did a really interesting job, mm -hmm. uh, taking material that I'm not sure quite I would have known quite how to display. It was very interesting for me, as a curator of this exhibition, to really see how Ralph Rapson's work uh, his, the history of his work is really part of the history of modern architecture um, as a whole and to be able to trace that history through his many projects particularly for me was interesting um, his involvement in furniture design uh, in the wartime and post-war period that is the Second World War and how he contributed to a lot of the designs that we recognize today um, designing for firms that are very well known such as Knoll and also his involvement in promoting modern design, which he did with his store, Raps and Inc., with his wife Mary in Boston in the 1950s. I've always been interested in, in all of the furnishings, uh, lighting, fabrics, furniture, both the design of them and production. So for some strange reason, my wife and myself uh, decided to start a a small store in in uh, in uh, Boston, which would be an opportunity not only to design specific or custom pieces, but but uh, to display and sell uh, what limited contemporary things there were on the market. Mm -hmm. We had a big discussion that was uh, somewhat difficult at points about what ought to go on the cover. Mm -hmm. oh. and, um, Out of all these beautiful drawings, yeah. or if it is a drawing. Yeah. Right. Well, it's the one time you also have the chance to go to full color. Um, yeah. Yes. And w yes. for a long time, so I think the leading candidate was this great picture of his glass home in Wisconsin, which is a fabulous photograph of the dramatic yeah. sky and yeah. everything else. But I think it, the point Bruce made was ultimately persuasive that much of the book has to do with drawing style, oh. and so yes. d using a drawing rather than a photograph. A lot of it has to do with the, a time prior to his coming to Minnesota. Yeah. First, you don't get to his Minnesota years until the eighth chapter. <laughs> so, so much of, which is sort of my fault, I love this early kind mm -hmm. of well, no, fun wonderful. stuff. And, yeah. um, but I think that, I think the cover represents in many ways a lot of dimensions of the book and it's yeah. a nice entry into the book in the sense that it does mm -hmm. reflect a time, it reflects a style, it reflects an attitude and then there's this great photograph of yeah. dad with a pipe sticking up in the air, <laughs> yes. a little goatee, it's a very jaunty yeah. Rapson as opposed to the more formal tuxedoed Rapson yeah. that's on the inside of the book jacket. Yeah. So I, I actually think the cover itself is, is, yeah. is worth the effort. The drawings throughout the book mm -hmm. are just an incredible reference mm -hmm. Uh, for drawing styles and I mean people will sometimes buy a book just to learn how to draw mm. and you, you can learn about him and learn how to draw at the same time. Yeah. We're talking with the authors of the book Ralph Rapson, 60 Years of Modern Design and we'll continue in a second part. Even in these days of computer graphics etc I, I still prefer to approach projects by drawing and sketching. Mm -hmm. Thank you.